Fire behavior fuel models are useful tools for understanding and communicating potential fire behavior. At a basic level, fuel models are simply a combination of fuel descriptors that are used as inputs into Rothermel's fire spread equation. You can learn about the background and application of fire behavior fuel models by watching Introduction to Fire Behavior Fuel Models, linked to below and on the World of Wildland Fire webpage. The steps discussed here are summarized in the document Steps for Selecting a Fire Behavior Fuel Model, linked to below. Like the name describes, the Fire Behavior Fuel Model is selected based on what is going to burn and generally how it will burn under a set of conditions. It's a common misconception that Fire Behavior Fuel Models, termed simply Fuel Models for short, are selected based on the existing vegetation. There is certainly a connection between what vegetation is on the site and the expected fire behavior, but it's very important that the selection of fire behavior fuel models stays rooted in the fire behavior. Another common misconception is that fuel models are always the same throughout the year or from year to year. But does what will burn change throughout the year? Does fuel change over time, either through growth and succession or through the influence of drought or increased moisture? When fuel changes, so does the expected fire behavior, and so might the fuel model, depending on the degree of change. You might be asking yourself, if I already know how it's going to burn, why do I need a fuel model? First, it's important to recognize that even with extensive experience, there is much that we don't know about how fire will behave. Fuel models allow us to test what we don't know and are additionally very useful in communicating the conditions on your site. They are also key components of large-scale fire modeling programs used in prescribed burn planning and wildfire response. So the more accurate your fuel models are to your site, the more accurate your landscape-scale fire modeling will be at capturing the potential fire behavior and effects. Selecting a fuel model can be done by answering these four questions. What is the climate of your area, humid or dry? What is carrying the fire, grass? grass shrub, shrub, timber litter, timber understory, or slash blowdown. What size classes are represented, and what is the proportion of fuel in each category? Are the fuels dead, live, or both? Note the fuel bed depth, compactness, and size of the fuel. Consider both the presence and absence of size classes. What's the observed or expected fire behavior? A little background on some terms. Dead fuels only are things like slash and needle litter. Live fuels are herbaceous and woody fuels whose moisture content is tied to the season. See the videos on live and dead fuel moisture for more information on these terms. Fuels with a high moisture of extinction have extra volatile chemicals that allow them to burn even when fuel moistures are relatively high. Generally, fuel models with a higher moisture of extinction occur in the eastern and southeastern United States. Fuels with low moisture of extinction are fuels that cannot burn at high moisture contents because they don't have the chemical content to keep burning. Dynamic fuel models are fuel models that change as their moisture changes. When a fuel model contains herbaceous material, and that herbaceous material dries out, then it's moved into the dead category and treated just like it would be in peak summer conditions. When that fuel moisture increases, then the fire behavior that's modeled for that fuel model changes as well to respond to that increased moisture. Let's demonstrate this by looking at two similar fuel models. We've got a fire behavior fuel model 2 from the original 13 and a GR4. At first glance, these fuel models look pretty similar. We've got flame length that's about the same and our rate of spread is even pretty similar. But when I change my herbaceous and woody fuel moistures and I increase that, I see a significant change in the fire behavior. In the fire behavior fuel model flow chart, these dynamic fuel models are indicated with stars. So why is it important to select a dynamic fuel model? Well, if you're modeling fire behavior during the non-peak time of year, and you have fluctuations in your herbaceous fuel moisture, then selecting a dynamic fuel model and adjusting the appropriate moisture for that herbaceous content can make a great deal of difference in your modeled fire behavior. Let's start with this example of a grassland in Nebraska. 
There are a few shrubs, but the area is dominated by grass, which is the primary fire carrier. This is a dry climate, so we want to look at fuels with low moistures of extinction, or dry climate fuels. Here's where some interpretation comes into play. How much grass is in this grassland? Is it sparse or dense, short or tall? What do you think the fire behavior would be, low, moderate, or high? In my experience, I feel this grassland would exhibit moderate fire behavior. This leads us to FB2, GR1, or GR2. The FB fuel model is from the original 13 fuel models and was developed to model fire behavior during peak of fire season. Feel free to use those if you wish. For this training, we're going to focus on the 40, since many of those fuel models are dynamic. Next, we'll look at the fuel model comparison graphs. Selecting a fuel model based on the primary fire carrier is a convenient way to start, but it's important to remember that we're trying to represent the fire behavior. It's possible that the fire behavior for your area is best represented by a fuel model in a different fuel category. These graphs are intended for you to be able to see your potential fuel model in comparison to others to see if there's a fuel model that better represents your fire behavior. Each figure compares the fuel models in a slightly different way in order for you to get various perspectives on how they relate. Notice the x-axis is heat per unit area. Not sure what that is? Well, if rate of spread is how fast you'll need to move to catch a fire, and flame length is what type of resources you'll need to use to fight the fire, then heat per unit area is the amount of effort that's needed to put it out. Additionally, heat per unit area is directly related to the fire severity on a site. A grass fuel model will have relatively low heat per unit area, and a timber understory or slash fuel model will have relatively high heat per unit area and therefore higher fire severity. There are 10 points for each fuel model, representing the fire behavior at mid-flame winds from 1 to 10 miles per hour. Now we look at PMS 153, Scottenberg in 2005. Find the fuel models you have in question and compare their fire behavior charts. Notice I did not say compare their pictures or names. Using the pictures and names to select fuel model can be very deceiving. Stick to the modeled fire behavior. These figures represent fire behavior for an area with no slope under a variety of dead fuel moisture conditions as indicated by the different lines. The live fuels for these figures are two thirds of the way cured. That means if your live fuels are different than two thirds of the way cured, then you'll see some different fire behavior. This number up here at the top is also a helpful thing to reference. Some people refer to the fuel models only by these numbers, and some people refer to them as their names, so it's good to be familiar with both the name and the number. Another tool that's very useful when you have access to a computer is the Compare Models for Excel spreadsheet, which is linked to in the description of this video. Which of these fuel models best captures that expected or observed fire behavior? In this case, it seems like GR2 is a good match for the fire behavior that we're seeing. What if you do not find one that matches what we see? Try the fire behavior fuel models in the other categories. Note that it's possible to have a fuel model with a different name than the primary fire carrier. If the box in the flowchart has an italicized fuel category, existing fuel models in that fuel type do not represent those conditions well, and you'll need to think outside the box. Below are some suggestions for the different fuel categories that you might consider for that particular area. Now let's look at an example of a fuel model that might not be what you expect. This is a timber stand in northern Idaho that has a strong shrub component. It's early fall and the shrub leaves are still green. Based on past experience, we know that these shrubs are not available to burn until they start to turn color. Based on the picture, it'd be easy to select a shrub or timber understory fuel model but let's work through the selection process and see what we come up with. What's the primary fire carrier? There are some grass and some available forbs and shrubs, but for the most part, the primary carrier is needle litter, which puts us into the dead fuels only category. There are some dead and down material, but not enough to be called slash, so we'll go with the timber litter category. These are conifer needles, and on this site, we would expect to see low fire behavior. The names and brief descriptions of the fuel models are useful in doing an initial narrowing of your selection. 
And in this case, that helps us eliminate TL4, or small downed logs, TL5, high load conifer litter, and TL7, large downed logs, leaving us with TL1 and TL3. If neither of these fuel models look like a match, then we'll go back and look at TL4 and TL5. From the fuel model comparison graphs, we can see that there are other fuel models with similar fire behavior that we can consider or rule out. Notice that there are only five points for different wind speeds instead of 10. This is because in these fuel types, at a certain point, increased winds do not increase fire behavior much. They're already going pretty much as fast as they can go. It looks like SH1 has a similar fire behavior, but a slightly lower heat per unit area, which again we think of as the difficulty to control. SH1 also contains a dynamic, live herbaceous component, which is not a part of our timber litter. Since we do have shrubs in the mix here, it would be good to include SH1 in our consideration. Using the Compare Models spreadsheet, we can see the modeled fire behavior for our most likely fuel models. Although there are differences between our site and the picture, the fire behavior is most closely matched by TL3. With a TL3 fuel model, we are not accounting for the shrubs. On this site, you might select two fuel models so that you can account for the change in fire behavior when the live component becomes available. Notice how the modeled fire behavior for SH1 changes when you change the live fuel moisture. So to review, a fire behavior fuel model is selected based on the expected fire behavior, not necessarily the fuels. Don't get stuck trying to match your fuel model to the pictures. Remember, fuel models can change throughout the year and from year to year, so always take the time to reassess. The most important step you can take to becoming better at understanding fire behavior fuel models is to become a student of fire behavior. Fire behavior fuel models are very useful tools for communicating about the potential fire behavior in your area and in doing large-scale mapping and fire modeling using land fire in conjunction with other programs. The more comfortable you are with these concepts, the more useful of a tool they'll be. As you go on to use fire behavior fuel models, consider the words of Harry Gisborne, one of the early pioneers of fire modeling. If you have fought forest fires in every different fuel type, under all possible different kinds of weather, and if you have remembered exactly what happened in each of these combinations, your experienced judgment is probably pretty good. But if you have not fought all sizes of fires in all kinds of fuel types under all kinds of weather, then your experience does not include knowledge of all the conditions. Fire behavior fuel models are helpful tools for filling in the gaps in our experience or memory with repeatable predictions of fire behavior under various conditions.